Okay, welcome everyone. Today is uh, today's speaker is Daniel Apai. Uh, Daniel is a professor at University of Arizona at both Stewart Observatory and uh, LPL. And he is a PI, he was a PI of the Earth in Other Solar System Nexus program and also um, uh, ICAR project for Alien Earth. And Daniel has many other projects. Um, so uh, this is not the first time, so I will just um, uh, have a short introduction. But Daniel, well, uh, this is floor is yours. And if you have any response that you want to get from the uh, uh, audience, you feel free to uh, ask for that. And I will uh, read the chat questions for you. OK. Wonderful. Thank you, Serena. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So um, this is a little bit of an unusual origin seminar. Uh, this is not a final uh, set of results that I'm going to share with you, but rather a progress update um, on our quantitative habitability science working groups uh, work. Um, and uh, I will leave the second half of the uh, seminar slot for discussion because I'm very interested in um, your input and your thoughts. Uh, I, one of the goals here uh, of this presentation is to draw attention to the work that's uh, ongoing uh, in which uh, many of you may be interested in uh, participating or at least knowing about. Um, and it has many aspects, of course, uh, habitability, so that touches on uh, of the research of, of many of you and I see many friendly faces and um, uh, joining. So hopefully there will be a good discussion, good ideas, and then uh, some of you may find it uh, valuable to join the group and uh, help us uh, towards our goals. Okay, so without further ado, let, let me explain a little bit what the context is here and what, what we are trying to achieve. And uh, I should mention that this is, I'm presenting the talk, I'm one of the co-chairs currently of the Science Working Group, but this talk benefited also from input from Rory Barnes, uh, my co-chair of the group, and then also, uh, especially when we go to the substantive uh, content of the presentation and the manuscript in preparation, that really has input from uh, our science working group members. So uh, some of whom are in the uh, in the talk today, others are uh, not. Okay, so what is quantifying habitability? So I think we have uh, in the field used the word habitability and the term for decades now. And um, we all have an intuitive feeling of what it stands for. And uh, it is usually associated with the planet's uh, ability to host liquid water on the surface that then, then could be thought to basically be ideal for um, hosting life. Uh, but the details remain uh, not well specified and of, of, often, of course, are difficult to apply. So let me explain a little bit more what, what the challenges that we are trying to solve or at least contribute uh, towards solving. And let, let me put this also in the context of Astro 2020, the Decada survey report that came out uh, recently. And that kind of provides a context, a big picture context for uh, what we are trying to achieve in uh, astronomy and uh, the needs for um, habitability definition and uh, quantitative metric for it. So, um, the Astro 2020 report basically uh, was a very positive report for um, all of us interested in exoplanets, habitability and search for life uh, in the universe. It was placing these topics uh, up front into a, in a very prominent uh, place. Uh, it identified as one of its top priority areas, pathways to habitable worlds. And in fact, uh, I just did a search um, uh, looking at the Astro 2020, and I find that over 10% of the pages uh, of the report has the word habitable in it. So, in fact, the desire and the goal to identify, study, characterize, and understand uh, habitable planets uh, really is behind uh, and is one of the science drivers that leads to the high level recommendations in terms of research infrastructure in the US for the next decade and beyond. So it, it leads to a recommendation of the US ELT program, uh, among other many other recommendations, of course, but in terms of large investments, that has fared very, very highly, the top recommendation. And also in space, uh, on the NASA side, 
the Decatur survey recommended a uh, development, technology development, and then the development of a six meter mirror diameter mission. Uh, that um, with the one key goal, although it would do a variety of astrophysics, but one key goal of it would be to study up to about 25 potentially Earth like planets. So that's uh, if you just divide the roughly estimated cost by the number of planet uh, yield, you, you realize that basically this is going to each planet that is targeted in a mission and is characterized is going to be a very valuable uh, target. We have to be uh, do what we can to uh, guide selections, inform decision on which planets are prioritized over uh, what which systems are prioritized and how do we interpret the data. And the report itself, as do many of the white papers that fed into the report, recognizes the complexity of potentially habitable worlds. And um, we'll speak quite a bit about that in the, in the remainder of this uh, discussion. I would also mention that of the four mission concepts that were put in for flagship class mission to the Decatur survey, uh, two of them centered very heavily their science case on uh, the exploration studies and characterization of uh, habitable planets and the search for signatures of life. Obviously, HabEx and Lou are both did that, uh, although the Origin Space Telescope was uh, um, including that science cases uh, in its portfolio. So there is basically, a, we, we see that the term habitable uh, and our ability to select habitable plants and understand the potential of plants for habitability plays a key role in the future of uh, astrophysics and exoplanets. Uh, let me just show you two examples of how this was discussed in the Luar and HabEx reports, which are really phenomenal um, works. And I really recommend everyone, uh, especially junior scientists to take the time and look through these reports because they are really very well done. Both of these, both HabEx and LUOR that fed into the Astro 2020 Decada, imagine a process and uh, in which uh, an initial larger list of targets are through iterative observations, increasing um, the knowledge and information we have about uh, 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 the planets, narrows it down to uh, towards basically more and more likely to be habitable planets. And then uh, on those planets, there will be a biosignature search survey conducted. And then the result of those detections will be basically interpreted in the context of the planet's properties. So let me just show you uh, the Luar uh, pyramid here. It basically goes from the top to, to the bottom. Uh, it uses precursor information to establish a target list. The multicolor point source photometry and proper motion to um, narrow it down. Multiple observations constrain the orbits uh, of the planet. And so that helps with the decision whether or not the planet is in the habitable zone. And then there will be an atmospheric signature search for a search for atmospheric signatures of water. Um, and then eventually the language in the reports switches over from, from planets to habitable planets that would be further characterized. So it will there will be a characterization of the stars activity level in terms of to understand better the, uh, in, its impact on the uh, atmosphere, determine plant masses, search for biosignatures and constrain H2 abundance and check for biosignatures that are in false positives. And then basically these last steps are focusing on what does it take to establish that the potential biosignature is in fact the signature of life. So you can see that basically the while um, uh, I will speak less about the specific interpretation of biosignatures and how to detect them, this discussion is mostly focusing on the top half of this pyramid and how do we transition from uh, the bluer to the greener color seal. This is the HabEx version of the same pyramid. It goes uh, from uh, bottom up uh, here, but the logic is the same. It starts with available precursor observations, aims for broadband detection, confirmation and orbit determination, water vapor detection, and then search for biosignatures and ruling out the false positives. So uh, it is basically, in a sense, both of these approaches is a process of elimination. Uh, and uh, a drive towards better and better establishing that the planet is uh, likely habitable. 
So this, obviously, the allocation of the time, the selection and prioritization of the targets in both of these missions, and also uh, mission concepts, uh, very heavily relies on our ability to understand the planet's properties and correctly assess whether or not it can, in fact, uh, uh, be called a habitable planet. Yet none of these, uh, and I think that's intentional, none of these reports really lays down a, a clear quantitative framework on how we would transition from the broader list towards the narrower list, the most likely to be habitable plants or habitable planets. I, I will get to a little bit later. The actual details of how one would do that and how would correct, quantify that remains uh, basically a key challenge. That's what we are would be exploring here. And I think it's just kind of interesting to put it in context. I mean, again, this should, doesn't come as a surprise to any of us, but if you were to look at the solar system from uh, afar, uh, you would notice that, of course, Earth and Venus would appear very similar planets. Uh, Venus, uh, both in size, in mass, and even in their location, relative location in the solar system. Where Venus is closer to the sun than uh, Earth is, but uh, they are, close enough in properties that uh, they could be considered under the same category for a while, unless you, until you start to understand their atmospheric differences. So this is just a little bit of a provocative uh, slide perhaps, but, uh, and, uh, but it kind of aims to demonstrate a little bit the thinking that is uh, currently uh, at least often found in the literature and in our community. Today when people think about potentially habitable plants or habitable planets, they often basically, of course, we have to start from what we know about these words, so we can explore whether their sizes is small enough that it could be compatible with something that's poorly Earth-like, uh, and oftentimes 1.5 or 1.6 uh, Earth radii are used, which is a fairly large, tr can translate to a fairly large mass range. And then the other question people ask uh, that we can often answer is whether the planet is in the habitable zone, um, under a set of assumptions. And if it is, then oftentimes it's assumed that this is a potentially habitable planet. Of course, there are many challenges uh, when it comes to the exact edge of the habitable zone, where exactly it lies and how it changes with stellar parameters, the evolution of the planets and uh, interior uh, composition, geophysics, etc. So uh, even the decision whether or not it's in the habitable zone uh, uh, can be uh, not straightforward. I would, uh, one vision for the future is that we would be able to transition from this kind of very simple yes no uh, assessment into more a picture when we, and this is just an example, it's, uh, that we could be employing a statistical framework that would integrate knowledge from multiple sources in a statistical manner so that, for example, the plant formation and evolution would be considered. Uh, and then it would be coupled to observational constraints in order to compute the likelihood, including basic uncertainties, that liquid water would exist on the planet today. So this is a different uh, approach and one that is much better suited to quantitative uh, decisions. So, of course, the challenge is that there are many factors that may render a planet uh, that is otherwise Earth-like, as far as we know it, but it may be inhabitable. And so, furthermore, some of the parameters uh, that may play key roles on processes uh, can be measured, such as uh, the mass or radius of the planet, present day irradiation, but others may not be possible to measure at all. So I've just put here a table from a white paper uh, several of us have uh, written and submitted to the um, uh, NES uh, exoplanet and astrobiology uh, strategy um, uh, surveys. This, this highlights basically a set of uh, internal parameters uh, or uh, evolutionary processes that cannot be directly measured, uh, yet they may form very, they, they may have an impact on the potential habitability of the planet. Similar arguments have been made by other groups too, so I would just mention here this. Uh, famous or maybe infamous diagram of planets are hard that kind of um, from uh, Vicky Meadows, Rory Barnes and the VPL team that illustrates many, not all, but many of the processes and considerations that fall in 
into assessing a potential habitability of a planet and, and whether or not it can actually uh, host life. So the question is, how do we go about basically working with incomplete information, uh, both in terms of the big picture frameworks and then also in terms of specific planets and how we can still come up with a terminology, a system of terms and a method that is consistent and can be used. So that's where in part uh, NASA Nexus comes in. And um, um, just a quick refresher what Nexus is. So Nexus for Exoplanet System Science is funded through NASA's ICAR program, the International Consortium for Astrobiology Research. It is a research coordination network. It's one of five networks. Um, planetary habitability is actually playing a central component in Nexus from the beginning on. So that was is very much organized around uh, that. Uh, theme. Nexus um, is currently has about 450-500 exoplanet researchers, uh, mostly from the US, but it is open internationally and we have many partners uh, from uh, beyond the US too. Uh, I'm, uh, maybe I should mention I'm one of the uh, four colleagues of Nexus, uh, helping uh, Nexus uh, towards its goals. Much of the science uh, is done within Nexus through science working groups. There are eight science working groups. These are led by co-chairs. They work different ways and uh, uh, and different levels. I will be here speaking about a quantitative habitability science working group. This was the one, the first one actually to be proposed and to uh, form in September 2020. I was the first chair of the quantitative habitability working group, and over the past years, I've been co-chairing it with Rory Barnes. Um, and uh, our Alien Earth team is providing support for the operations of the science working group. And many in the community, both within and beyond Nexus, have been participating. So we had lots of fun discussions. I want to show you a little bit what we have done and then transition to um, some, a working document, uh, which we are hoping that is going to become a submitted manuscript. And we can explore that and uh, open it up for discussion. So when we started the science working group, the quantitative habitability science working group, we had a charter, we put in a proposal. And um, I, if you are interested, this is available through Nexus. I will just basically highlight here uh, the, a couple of goals. So we said that we would like to establish efficient channels of communication for the relevant groups, engage with and include as large fraction of the community as possible, identify and connect to existing resources and activities, to avoid duplication, establish a centralized online hub to collect and organize relevant data sets, publications, and links, and organize quarterly workshops uh, integrating the quantitative knowledge and habitability. And originally, we said that we would be doing this for one year and then assess how to proceed. <coughs> and I would just mention briefly in passing, I won't have time to go into details here, that our Alien Earth team, I mentioned it's supporting the quantitative habitability. Uh, science working group and much of the research that we do and many on the call uh, are members of our uh, team are uh, falling squarely into the uh, set of topics that are relevant for uh, advancing the science background here. So many of the talks also corresponding to the origin seminar uh, touch on these. So in terms of the activities, uh, without going to, into too much details, what we have been, we have been uh, working on over the past two years, in terms of the communication channels, we created literally a Slack channel. Uh, we did a quantitative habitability email list that many of you are on. We have established a web page. Um, we have seminars. I will speak a little bit about these. We had for one and a half years bi weekly meetings. We transitioned now to monthly meetings. We organized a very large workshop and proposed a double SP session. We also created basically on our web pages an online hub collecting resources, models, etc., which then has, has been moved over to another, uh, the new Nexus site. We are in discussion with the Goddard Space Flight Center's EMAC group about uh, synergies. They have also uh, put together an excellent resource, uh, EMAC, uh, for collecting models, methods, and data related to exoplanets. So uh, there is some uh, redundancy there, and uh, we will be uh, merging those efforts uh, and contributing ours uh, to the EMAC. We have also built an ADS library of relevant publications and continue to collect uh, papers related to habitability. 
we have a community engagement uh, across Nexus and beyond. So we have 65 members of the community on the Slack channel. Uh, our email list is about 40. But when we organized a workshop where we anticipated about 20, 30 people, actually 100 showed up. So this does reach many people and we had really uh, fun discussions. Uh, one of the continuously ongoing events or uh, regular events are the bi-weekly and monthly seminars. This is just an example for um, uh, an invitation and an agenda on those. These typically include a science highlight talk, news and announcements, and uh, joint work collaboration and discussion uh, on either a workshop program or working towards a manuscript uh, that I will share with you. We had, of course, multiple discussion on Astro 2020 and its potential, uh, how to best interpret that. We had really exciting talks from uh, many members of the community. So in December uh, 2020, we also organized the first of our workshops. Uh, and because of the pandemic, it was a fully online workshop. And I mentioned it, we thought it would be first smaller, but it turned out to be a really fun event and many, many people have participated. Uh, this is the program. I will not go through uh, the details, but the key point is that we had a mix of review talks, uh, science highlight talks, and discussions uh, on habitability. So uh, I learned about the uh, different opinions and uh, passion many share about defining habitability and coming up with a terminology for it. And it was a very useful uh, meeting to connect the community. We hope to organize other meetings in the future too. Currently, much of our work is focusing on uh, on the quantitative habitability uh, working document, which we hope will transition into a manuscript uh, to serve both as a review of the state of the art of the field, the different approaches, and then also uh, potentially and hopefully being able to provide a terminology, a quantitative framework in which habitability can be um, uh, interpreted and applied uh, to advance the field. So these, I will, after the slides, I think I have two, three more slides, and I will open up the actual PDF file so we will be able to take a look at the manuscript while we have discussion. But um, some examples of, you know, some, some of the content that we have there, we actually start with a bit of a general discussion on what factors make a scientific terminology or a terminology system a good one. And so this is non-trivial. And I think in astronomy, we kind of have some really great examples for really good terminology. And we also have examples for less good terminology that continues to lead to confusion. And um, definitely when we communicate to the broader public, but sometimes even communicating between professionals. We have terms that have not aged well, and uh, it is we built in assumptions occasionally into our terminology that then proved relatively quickly to be wrong. Uh, but terminology can outlive ideas uh, sometimes, and uh, we continue to use terminology uh, even after 100 years that is not uh, often not, not correct. So it is important, I think, to consider what is a terminology that is, what makes the terminology good or bad, and what what are the pitfalls we should avoid. So we also review the frameworks and use of terminology in the literature. Um, I, I will show some examples from this. We try to compile basically a pretty good assessment of how habitability uh, is used and referred to uh, in a variety of strategy reports. Um, and uh, we will pick and highlight a couple of examples from the literature too, although we will not aim for completeness there just because of the sheer volume of the papers. We had many discussions on uh, pitfalls and limitations. Uh, many people in the community have been worried about um, a terminology, uh, potential misuses, misunderstanding and confusion that the terminology that is not properly thought through could lead to. And so uh, that I think it's very uh, insight, uh, provides great insights and we'll be discussing that a bit. We also have collected habitability criteria factors and considerations, a list of things that can be considered. And importantly, we have decided over the course of the discussions that use cases are very important. It is important to consider how the definition should be used and what are the possible cases that should all be consistent with the kind of terminology or quantitative framework that we uh, propose to establish uh, or 
put forward. So I, I, I will show a couple of examples there. And then ultimately, the quantitative framework that can, uh, can be proposed or adopted if we decide that something in the literature already matches all the needs. So I, as I mentioned, this is a progress update. We, I don't, I'm not presenting to you a done and final work. It is rather an opportunity for, for you to join this effort and contribute ideas uh, now or later. So where are we now currently? So we have monthly meetings currently on Tuesdays. We just had one last week. I will be rotating out as a co-chair. So we will be looking for a new chair. I originally agreed and proposed to do this for one year. It's now two years that I'm doing it. And uh, I want to help advance the paper mostly. So I want to transition to that. And so um, uh, we will be finding a new chair, co-chair to work with Rory uh, to uh, organize the events and workshops. And I will be helping the group uh, moving the paper forward. So this, I think this is my last slide. And then next, I would like to switch over to PDF file to share with you where we are with the manuscript. But before doing so, let me stop here for a moment and see if there are any immediate questions now while I'm switching over. Okay, so let, I, I don't see any, and there will be definitely time for questions. So uh, let me switch over, just find my window, and then we can. I think there's a question. Yes. I, Daniel, just, just one, one I uh, question, because I, I thought that uh, the sizes of Earth and Venus were the same. So they are very similar in size. Right. OK. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. In your slide, you... uh, oh, did I have a wrong? 80% of the size of Earth, and that doesn't seem right to me. It's a minor detail, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, Andrew. Um, yeah, yeah, so I was just curious, um, you know, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> Uh, detection of water vapor being a first step and obviously there's water vapor in the earth's atmosphere um, but uh, not, not at a detectable level in Jupiter's atmosphere so I'm wondering and obviously Jupiter is not a habitable planet but I'm wondering if there are some details of potentially habitable planets where you may not see the water vapor because of uh, you know issues of atmospheric structure or clouds or anything like yes. that. Yes, absolutely. So that's basically, yes. So I would say that uh, both of the, um, the two reports that I mentioned and also other strategic documents, in the process it's laid out in how to go from planets of similar size and irradiation towards establishing that there's a, they are habitable, the actual steps uh, remain unclear or not quantitative. And in particular, both reports suggest, and I think that's an excellent, of course, step to uh, see whether or not water absorption is present and is detectable. But the absence of evidence doesn't mean uh, it's not an evidence of absence in this case. Uh, so you are right that establishing that connection that you have either detection or you have some certain constraints on the concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere often under some assumptions, how does that translate to the probability that you have liquid water on the surface is, is basically a big, uh, big question. I, I hope that answers your question, yeah. at least to recognize the question. I, I completely agree yeah. with you that that's no, I think a lot of people don't realize that it was only recently that water was detected on Jupiter, not in the standard ways, uh, but by looking at microwave radiation from deeper in the atmosphere. So water can come, you know, evidence for it can come in surprising ways. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm, I'm sharing the, the manuscript. And so let me, and this is, uh, there are more, uh, I think, uh, let, let me show you where we are now. We don't have a complete solution for this. We are in the process of assembling basic criteria, providing literature review, and, um, and then be working towards, uh, uh, hopefully, a, a framework and a solution. 
So where we are basically in terms of the, the just the key structure of the introduction will be emphasizing the kind of context that I mentioned before, and we'll provide a short history of habitability as well. Less, less new here, let me focus more on, uh, on some of the criteria that we identified for a good scientific terminology. So it is. It should be useful for the addressing the phenomenon it aims to describe, and it should not use misleading terms. So I think one of the risks that we made run into is that uh, if we define habitability in a way that is very contrary to what, uh, for example, the general public would interpret that, and so that is, uh, it does happen uh, already. Sometimes habitable planet is used in a sense that is. Uh, inconsistent with what people generally would agree on or would, would, would think about that. So that's something important to keep in mind. It should also provide a granularity that is practical for every day, but also for long-term use. So I think we can is, expect that as we know more about planets and small planets, that there uh, we will understand potential categories, different evolutionary pathways, etc. So uh, we will probably have to refine the term, but uh, it should be general enough. It should be a self-consistent system of terms. I mean, that sounds uh, obvious, but we in astronomy and also in science made sometimes the mistake that we are not uh, ending up with a terminology there. Uh, the individual terms should be clearly defined. We should not use terms that different people interpret differently. And then also we should be able to use them at the end, conclusive, uh, make conclusive and non-trivial statements within the system of terms. And it should also be something that is uh, has a legacy value. Conclusions are not expected to change substantially with more data. So, and, and uh, there have been some discussion of this, but most of the members in the science working would not think that it would be a good if uh, after one year of uh, or next space telescope's operation, we would need to redefine the terms and what was really found because uh, our, our terminology was not suitable and surviving the first contact with data. So there have been a number of you know, good and bad terminologies in science and in astronomy. I mean, we, we for example, still use protoplanetary nebula, um, uh, sorry, planetary nebula, but it is, um, doesn't have to do with uh, the planets. We use nebula uh, for a broad variety of uh, sources uh, Etc. Planets remain still a, a, a bit of an unclear definition, both within the solar system and beyond. Um, and then also good examples, we should basically have a scientific process that allows us to move from different categories in this terminology uh, through potentially through hypothesis, prediction, model, and theory kind of uh, in that framework, uh, and our terminology should be consistent. These, some of these look obvious, but they actually turn out to be not working for some of the ways people use habitability in the literature. So pitfalls and limitations, there are many. So one of the terminology pitfalls could be if we end up adopting a pitfall, a, a terminology or a framework that is then not adopted by you, right? If it, it can be very good, but if people don't end up using it, uh, it's not going to be um, reaching its, its purpose, of course. So it also has to be internally consistent. If it is inconsistent, it can lead to confusing and contradictory results, which is very easy to uh, imagine. It has to be also built on definitions and criteria that are um, uh, applicable in practice, or here this is the inverse if you speak about uh, pitfall. So what it, it is important to know what is that we are going to be able to be to measure in the future what is that we cannot and then so what are the questions or criteria that we can answer or assess and which are the ones that we can't and then it also has to be different from every uh, so this is an example for a pitfall if if basically the terminology we would adopt would be inconsistent or just different from what a uh, regular uh, people public would 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 uh, think when they hear about this term and so there are a couple of sorts here. I will not probably go too much into to details here, but some some groups have been using the word habitable in a way that an everyday person would really not think that that's uh, 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 what it means. And then, yes, if if we, another pitfall that was raised is that if the classification or important results based on this terminology remain uncertain, 
or require frequent revisions uh, that can really undermine the credibility of the field. Right? Uh, if we, I'm thinking here about New York Times uh, reports uh, needing to issue corrections because um, of announcements, etc., that were not uh, not uh, um, standing the test of time. Okay, so maybe a quick look here, and then I, I will have some time for discussion. Is basically the different reports. I will not go through the details, but. I looked through and uh, others contributed to the different reports and what is the language that habitability is used. And it is actually interesting that none of these reports really provides, as I mentioned, and for very good reasons, uh, a very clear pathway to how to uh, go, how to quantify habitability and what is the critical transition where they transition from uh, a potentially habitable planet or a candidate into a habitable planet. That transition does happen in the language but it is not tied to a specific set of measurements. And I think the good reason for that, it is, it's probably a bit premature to do that unless the community does agree that uh, uh, what is the best way to proceed. So oftentimes, basically, while habitable plants are mentioned, oftentimes they are mentioned with an adjective or potentially habitable planet or an uh, exorce candidate. And then somewhere in the text, there's a transition from which point on most of these reports start to speak about mostly habit habitable planets uh, or, or as candidates. Uh, or Earth's analogs are also used. Uh, and then again, the quantitative definition is, is just usually not, not there. These are not the only reports. The NES report on exoplanet strategy um, also uh, does not provide a quantitative framework. Um, also an exoplanet or astrobiology strategy. All of these are consistent in their spirit and I think consistent with the community. Most of the people's views and use of this terminology, but they lack the actual quantitative applicable, frame, applicable framework. Uh, and then the NSF roadmap going back to about 15 years or so does make a, a, a in its appendix makes a bit more uh, clear definition about uh, uh, what uh, planetary habitability means, surface habitability. Uh, but it, again, it doesn't go far enough to, to really provide a framework. And then the Astro 2020 is basically building on these other reports and uh, it does not have the quantitative framework, but more of an aspirational uh, goal for understanding habitable plants. And so then we have, I will not go through this, but we have been, uh, this in large part, the work of Noah Tucho. Uh, he has been uh, collecting different factors that, uh, uh, that have been considered in the literature uh, for having a potential impact on a planet's habitability. Uh, this goes often beyond the likely presence or absence of water uh, on the surface and speaks some of these concerns uh, address uh, uh, other aspects of habitability. What I did want to, and you will all have the opportunity to look into this manuscript, of course. Uh, what I did want to get to are three use cases that I think are important to keep in mind. And uh, if um, there are good reasons, we can add an additional science case or, or a use case, but uh, these have been capturing most of what people have been until now thinking about. These use cases, I think having clarity on how we would want to use this terminology um, can help make sure that what we end up with is in fact going to be consistent with, uh, with that use. Um, so, yes, so one use case is uh, exporter observations candidate characterization. So this, uh, this basically could be when we have to decide what sort of a Properties, for example, large ground-based telescopes, RV spectrograph should have, or uh, what sort of constraints we need to place on, uh, for example, on a planetary system, etc. So these are uh, precursor observations that don't necessarily directly characterize or discover the planet itself, but help uh, identify and prioritize candidates. Uh, they can drive mission designs already. So this is actually something that uh, I should mention that while some of the missions that will be 
studying habitable plants and searching for signatures of life by maybe decades in the future. Uh, the work to define targets and derive the science requirements and understand what we really need these telescopes to be able to achieve, that is basically happening now in the next year. So this is work that is relevant now. Second use case is target selection. So in this case, we maybe from the mission itself or from supporting uh, observations, we have available data on the planet themselves and we must be able to prioritize them uh, if the resources such as telescope time or ability to revisit them, observing opportunities are limited as likely they will be. So we will want to basically have a, a able to combine contextual understanding of the planets with observations of the specific planets and so to assess the likelihood of the planet being habitable. And so these uh, are likely going to, they have to be quantitative and likely going to be probabilistic in, in nature. The third use case is basically biosignature interpretation. So uh, here what is assumed is that there is an observation existing maybe midway through the mission, maybe at the end of the mission, where uh, the detected signal is consistent with atmospheric biosignatures being present in the atmosphere. But knowledge of uh, and assessment of whether or not the planet is likely or unlikely to be habitable will basically be providing a context or maybe a prior for the actual interpretation of the biosignature detection. So the framework that uh, idea we should end up with should be consistent with and enable the, uh, that kind of interpretation of the biosignatures too. So these are the use cases and I think that basically brings me to the end of the kind of the, the key things I wanted to share with you. I will mention I will just open it up for discussion, but I will mention that if the science working group is open for everyone, whether you are in Nexus or not, it is easier if you are a Nexus affiliate, but please let me know if you would like to join and we can add you even if you are not in Nexus. Uh, if you are Nexus in Nexus already, you can just simply join the Slack channel. That's probably the easiest way to uh, to, to learn what's going on. And then we welcome contributions and participation in our discussions. Uh, mostly by weekly or in the workshops and also contributions and participation in, in helping us uh, come up with a framework and then finalize this uh, manuscript. We hope that in the course of the next half a year or so, this will be finalized and submitted uh, to our journal. So let me stop there and then uh, open it up for discussions and I'm, I'm discussion I'm looking forward to, to your comments and thoughts. So Daniel, there are two chat messages. Yes. So. Um, so the first question is from Richard Gordon. Um, Richard is saying, given the assumption that microorganisms might be more prevalent, is research going on on the impact of different kinds on, of various atmospheres as atmosphere properties are what we might measure? So I would say that uh, to a great extent, uh, yes. So basically, but not I, I don't think we have a complete answer there. So it is an important point indeed. Um, most of the biosignatures that are currently looked at are focusing on um, on atmospheric, so biosignatures that are, uh, for example, would be emerging as a result of metabolic byproducts, mostly by simple bio microorganisms. And uh, there have been studies looking at non-oxygenic uh, atmospheres, uh, uh, the first, for example, Earth's uh, uh, first uh, half of its lifetime, an example for that, and uh, biosignatures that would emerge from there. So it's been being looked at. I think the practical reality is that the farther you venture from Earth-like conditions and an Earth-like ecosystem, the less certain our predictions uh, will be. But, um, but definitely it would be ideal if the, I think if the framework would be consistent with the application to non-terrestrial uh, 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 analogs or non-terrestrial life too. With a, I imagine that we would be ending up with a terminology system that you may use objectives to express if you are speaking about maybe a different alien biochemistry, if that answers your question. So there are, there's uh, from Dante is mentioning the super habitability, uh, which uh, has been proposed. And so I think that's 
there are approaches that assign a planet or give a scale to habitability, uh, which is, is one kind of approach that exists in the literature. Uh, another approach is to basically have uh, a probabilistic uh, assessment of a, a liquid surface, water, yes or no kind of metric, and then also going beyond. So I think it would be interesting to reconcile these. Yes. And um, uh, Matthew is asking, how does one join Nexus? So if you go to the Nexus website, which I will put here, there is, um, you will find that basically a, a, a form that you can fill out if you would like to become a Nexus affiliate. You just need to provide some basic information and then you can join. If you are, um, if you are actually a member of a team that has funding from NASA and is associated with Nexus, then you don't even have to do that. You can just notify your PI of your team and then they will be able to add uh, ID. Uh, okay, I see a question from Vic. Yes, uh, Daniel. Um, I'm a geologist, of course, and that is a science that has a lot of issues with terminology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see that that's uh, a, a, a very much an issue for you. And what I would um, ask about is a philosophical aspect of terminology, which is called pragmatism. And in the pragmatic approach to terminology, the key question for the terminology is the practical consequences that arise from adopting a particular terminology. In other words, the, if the issue is to facilitate discoveries in regard to certain things like the presence of life or some other factor, then the driving force for the terminology should be the process that follows from adopting that term that leads to those discoveries. It, it, I think this is implicit in some of the examples you have, but that, that exact sort of criterion, I don't see that expressed. And obviously there's issues like if, if life becomes the key factor, then the definition of life is of course another issue to uh, to be resolved. But if there's other uh, key factors like the presence of water, um, a liquid water on the surface, other things, they become practical consequences that should derive and be facilitated by that terminology. Yes, I, yes, thank you, Rick. I think that's an excellent point. And I think uh, if I'm interpreting everything correctly that you are saying, so basically you have to look at, and then we kind of have been looking into basically the terminology through the lens of applicability and then subsequent uh, uses and interpretation. And uh, um, this is a little bit interesting situation in a sense that we are basically as a community, uh, we will be defining what are the science requirements, for example, for missions that will be the prime source of data on the planets of interest. Uh, and so it's kind of a, we are defining both the measurements that we will be doing and what we want to be able to do together with basically the, uh, the, the terminology. And uh, I, I completely agree with you that I think these need to go somehow hand in hand and uh, making sure that anything that we define is applicable and then once and uh, connects to reality in terms of the questions that can be answered, measured properties, and then uh, flowing downstream from that. Yeah, I, th I think a, a key element is to keep open the possibility of new discoveries because you you are definitely going into an area where surprises will occur and you want something that will be flexible so those surprises can be acted upon and facilitate the scientific discovery process that's an excellent point and i agree with you i think the 
why it is particularly challenging, and I think why it is important that we actually speak about also this terminology, is that the habitable exoplanets and search for signature of, sort of life remain so challenging, even 20 years into the future, that um, most of the information that we will have, detailed information, may come from you know just one or two missions. And uh, oftentimes those missions have basically, they are pretty much designed to marginally be able to detect uh, just the, the reality of it by signatures in the modest sample. And so the, when, so we will be pretty signal to noise limited oftentimes, and that leaves basically exactly what you, and I completely agree with you, that the ability to further explore planets and move on basically unpredicted discoveries uh, that is going to be probably a bit more limited, at least for for these kind of plans. Yeah. But I think that the planetary context, basically uh, interpreting these questions in a planetary context and having the flexibility is, is very important to succeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I see Andrew Yudin has another comment or question, and then I see a question from Steve Irta. Um, um. Yeah, Daniel, thanks. So yeah, I actually also kind of wanted to ask a question about uh, the unexpected, but I guess more from what you were talking about of the sort of intense public interest and how this is reflected in news reports and how the public reacts to that. Um, so I think we saw a good example of that last year with a sort of somewhat controversial detection of an unexpected uh, biosignature in the form of uh, phosphine. Right, and so that, right, it's, it seems likely that, right, because, uh, right, these are such challenging measurements that, right, things that are uncertain or non-standard, uh, there's going to be quite a few of those that come out before there's the first, oh yeah, this is clearly like Earth. Um, and I don't know, what are the, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on, oh, well, by the time the eventual Earth analog is discovered, how tired will the public already be of claims of the discovery of biosignatures? I think that that is a very important, you know, consideration. And I, I worry a little bit about uh, this, and I think everybody does. I think it's a question of what is that can be, can be done about it. And uh, I, the, the, some of the challenges I see, I mean, if you think about that, the, the phosphine in Venus is an example, Methane in, Mar in Mars, in the Martian atmosphere, is another example of that uh, uh, marginal detections. Now, I think there is an increasing evidence that shows that probably these are real, but at the same time, it's kind of inconsistent with the atmospheric chemistry of Mars, and so it is. Uh, it remains an example of even Mars, of which we know much more than we will know about these planets. It remains difficult to interpret. Uh, a possible detection of uh, out of equilibrium gases. So I think that is a, a challenge. Another challenge is that I think, and I also worry about this, is that we won't, as things go now, we won't have a redundancy. We will not have an independent team that can use a different instrument and make the same measurement and then uh, get to the same data because we will have basically a single telescope that uh, will reach that. So I think. And then also, I think another challenge related is basically the context that uh, we really, I think, need to interpret biosignatures. Uh, will be even more difficult to interpret than habitability, most likely. And, uh, and then even for the habitability, we need to understand basically a complex system that is, goes well beyond the amount of information that we can connect. So I think, I personally think that the way forward is that we actually have a, a, a con, um, contextual understanding of planetary systems, their evolutions, and planets' evolution and their formation, so that we have more information to work with than just a single planet. We will be looking at them as examples, you know, of a larger sample and interpret them in that context, probabilistically. But yeah. um, and uh, Steve Orter has yeah. a question yes, in the let's chat. Go to Steve's. Question. So Steve is asking, uh, is the wider planetary system considered a constraint on habitability? What impacts the, do other planets and minor bodies in the system have on habitability? Um, and that can be important, uh, both in terms of impacts, for example, and 
uh, increasing or decreasing the fatal impacts. I, I agree with you. So I think that, in fact, in the, I showed earlier this planets are complex diagram, and that has, uh, I, and I think that is really, we, we cannot take planets as just, uh, you know, isolated universes, but we have to look at them basically through the lens of also the quantum system itself. I do think that actually the formation and evolution of the planets, even if we cannot directly observe them, but to some extent we can infer things about those if we study our human planetary system and impacts also in terms of delivering, for example, organics and volatiles are probably going to be quite important there. I, yeah, and um, yeah, the question is, I think we have some examples and ideas how what could be a quantitative framework that we can fold that in, but that is a, a going to be a, an important challenge. And I agree. Vic, do you have another question or is this the same virtual hand? I guess it was the same question. Okay. Is there any other question? Could you raise your hand or um, write in chat? Last call. Okay, so let's unmute and thank Daniel for his excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the questions. And then yes, if you guys are interested, please join us in our science working group meetings. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.